I'm Ruth Quaid and I am the water conservation coordinator for the city of Greeley. So a lot of times I get questions about how'd you learn so much about gardening? And the truth of it is I've made a lot of mistakes. So I found this quote and I think it's pretty appropriate. My green thumb came only as a result of the mistakes I've made while learning to see things from the plant's point of view. <laughs> how many are seasoned gardeners? Is that true? Pretty true, okay. So why landscape our yards? We're in this semi-arid climate. Why even bother? Why not just put out rock? Well, because it increases your property value. That's the biggest thing right there. It's gonna be more money, more on the bottom line when you sell your house. It improves air quality. All of those plants doing their little thing, they take carbon dioxide out of the air, they convert it into oxygen, helps with CO2 emissions, so it improves air quality. All the roots, filter water. So rainwater falling on your house picks up pollutants from the roof, from the um, driveways, the streets. If it passes through plants in a root system before it goes back into the river or ditch or stream, then it's going to be better quality. Of course, we know what a nice big shady tree can do for a parked car or your house in the summer. It's going to help with energy conservation. Aesthetic value, it's beautiful. Helps give you pride in your home in your home and in your neighborhood. If you have a nice neighborhood, it makes you feel proud to come home. I already kind of talked about the property values, but it does add economic value. And plant relationships. It helps you commune with nature and have a relationship with your yard. And then the other big thing is as we've urbanized, we pushed out habitat, so it also provides habitat. So Xeriscape is the use of climate adapted plants, so can be native, not always. It doesn't have to be native, but climate adapted plants, and it's more of a system. It's not a specific look, and I have a few slides coming up to show you. I talked about the benefits, but you can get 46% or more savings in your Xeriscape yard from a traditional bluegrass turf yard. Um, it can be reduced maintenance. It can be more maintenance if you have a lot of perennials and things that need to be weeded and deadheaded and that kind of stuff. But you can design it and our March class is gonna be designing with maintenance in mind. So come back for that one because you can make it less maintenance. It's more attractive. A flat yard in the winter with snow on it is kind of boring. But if you have some ornamental grasses catching snow and some structure in your garden, it's a lot prettier. Generally, it's less pesticides because especially if you're using natives, you don't need a lot of pesticides because they have natural predators that take care of bugs and things. So here's the seven steps. I'm not going to, I'm gonna leave it here for a minute if you want to write them down, but I'm gonna go through each step so don't feel like you have to scribble it down real quick. So a lot of people think landscaping is either this bluegrass lawn or rock and mulch. And they real, don't realize that there's a whole spectrum in between. It's like what I said earlier, it's a system. So you can have as much lawn or as much mulched areas as you want. The best thing to do is design it for you and your family and your needs. And I'm gonna get this one out of the way. This is not Xeriscape, this is Xeroscape. If you do this, you will not meet city code and code enforcement will be out there talking to you. The other misnomer I get is people say, well, my HOA says I have to put in bluegrass. That is not true. In 2013, the Colorado legislature passed a law that says that they cannot require you limit xeriscape or drought tolerant plants. They can't force you to water your lawn in a drought. So. Just make sure you have that in your back pocket if your homeowners association comes to you, okay? And I'm not gonna read that whole thing to you either. So planning and design, this is the most important thing. We always do this beginning Xeriscape class in January so that you have time to start thinking about these things and prepare for spring. And then you can hit the ground running. And with as mild as the temperature has been, you can even start doing things like putting in walkways or edging or you know, the hardscape materials that you might want to do. So think about how you want to use your yard. Do you need to entertain? I have 
the next slide. Think about slopes, overhead wires. People always forget to look up and think, um, you know, forget that there's trees going to get into it. And how many times have you seen the trees chopped off? I hate to see that. So look up above. Call 811. Get your underground utilities marked so that you don't get into, some, get into you know, your power lines and kill yourself. Think how you want to use your space. Do you have kids or pets? Do you want a vegetable garden? What's your exposure? And I have a picture of an actual plot plant I'm going to show you. But plants on the south and west side of the house, they can take it hotter and drier. Or you're going to want to put your plants on the west and south that are, can take the hot and dry. And then consider all the different microclimates in your yard. If you have a drainage issue, think about that when you're designing it. How you can divert that water away from your foundation. And then phase your project. Most people can't do it all in one year, either your bank account or your body. So phase your project. And start with the irrigation, the hardscaping, that kind of stuff um, first, so that then you know where you can put your plants. So the first thing you want to do is go get your site plan that came with your deed. If you don't have that, the city of Greeley has maps where you can put in your address and pull up your site plan. It's greeleygov.com and then just look for the maps button on the home page. That way you can blow it up as big as you can and then you can kind of use that. I like to put tracing paper over it and then you can make all kinds of iterations of the landscape. So draw, sketch your driveway on there, your sidewalks, maybe this concrete patio right here isn't on there, but you want to put a concrete patio. Then you can go ahead and sketch that in where you want it. Maybe you want it on the other side. So have one on regular paper and then put your tracing paper over it and do your iterations on that. So then when I was talking about earlier, some of the things you want to do. So there's open space down here. Maybe that's where you want the kids and the dogs to run around. Maybe you want a garden back here. Maybe this is a dog run right here instead of um, a planting bed. So do those kinds of things. Does your neighbor over here have a hot tub and he likes to sit out there in the hot tub in the nude? Maybe you want to screen that. Maybe you want to enhance your view. It says Lakeview on this. It says Lakeview on this, but in Colorado, you're going to want to look at the mountains. If you're lucky to be on the west side of town, you don't want to be, put a big old tree there and block your view of the mountains and the sunsets. So think about those things too. So on your conceptual plan, like I said, do the hardscape and irrigation first. Um, to do the irrigation and design that, what you're going to want to do is have an idea where your beds are so that you can do drip versus lawn. But then those are the things that are going to get installed first. So mark your turf areas, mark your bed areas. Mark what's going to be pet or play areas that don't need irrigation. And then keep in mind those screens or views that you're accentuating. If you need a gazebo on the back of the property or sheds or a pergola, playhouses for kids, put all that on there. Put all your ideas on there and then decide what you, you're going to do and what you can do. The other thing on your plan you might want to mark is prevailing winds. They generally in the winter are coming out of the northwest but maybe the way your house is set it, situated, it's not coming that way. So think about that too, because you might want to screen with something dense, conifers or something. So slopes, people tend to think of those as problems, but you can think of them as an opportunity. Here's some creative ways to deal with a slope. I think the picture on the left I took at the Windsor Garden tour a few years ago, but the one on the right is here in Greeley. So, you know, in the summer, if you have a half an hour, go drive around town, look at some of the houses and what they've done. This is like in the Glenmere area. Drainage. Um, we see this a lot in new neighborhoods where stormwater, once the lot's graded to take the water along the property line, but then the neighbor never changes their clock from putting in their irrigation system and establishing sod so it's constantly running and then the other neighbor has to put in a drainage way. That's a good way to deal with that. 
The other way to deal with that is call us and we'll send them a nice little letter. Um, but you can do a tri dry creek bed to deal with that. And you can also make it kind of a nice feature in your yard. So it's kind of like having a water feature without having to actually care for it. <laughs> um, that's also a good way to create rain gardens and take advantage of that water coming off the roof. And we're going to have a class on how to build a rain garden too. So it took me a while to find someone that could speak to that. So it's um, <coughs> where you harvest the water off of like your roof and your paved surfaces and put it back into the landscape because what I was talking about earlier, that pl those plant materials and that soil act as a filter. So it improves the water quality before it goes back into um, the water system. So most of our water goes into ditches and then it eventually goes to the pooter or the plat. So we wanna clean up that water before it goes back in there because <coughs> grease, oil from your cars, people, homeowners put more pesticides on their lawn than all the farmers. All of that stuff just goes right back into the river and creates problems downstream. So it's kind of thinking about your property as its own little watershed and trying to keep the water there detain it a little bit before it goes back into the system. Um, Overwatering, I already kind of talked about that one. And it's a good way to move water off of your paved areas. And also you want to keep it away from your foundations. So create practical turf areas. I like this picture because I like how they have the walkway right along the edge of the grass. And I'm going to actually do this in my yard because the grass is always creeping under the edging and getting into my beds. So this is good. I think this is a good way to go about this to keep the grass from creeping into your beds. Also, not as much maintenance. Because weeding grass is harder than any weed, I swear. So think about where it makes sense for you to have turf. If you've got turf on your property and the only time you're walking on it is to mow it, you probably could do something else with it. Um, the little parkways, the little strip parkways with the detached sidewalk. I hate seeing turf in those, you know. You never, you, you walk across it to get from the car to the house. That's about it. Um, think about other places like along the driveway and the side of the house to get to the back of the yard. If you're constantly wearing a path in the grass, that might be a place to take it out. So long, narrow strips that the sprinkler oversprays, another place. Um, you don't ever want to put grass up to your foundation because we talked about that already. You don't want water sitting at your foundation. And um, the path to the backyard, shed, or the dog run. Those are all places where you're constantly tracking through. Can you guys see the screens okay? Yeah. And I can't use a laser pointer because it would only go on one of them. Sorry. There's not a whole lot I'm going to point to. Um, here's some more. See, you see the stepping stones between the grass and the bed. Another good way to do it. And then this one, here's the pointer after I just said I'm not going to use it. This one, it's kind of a pass through to another area of the yard. So they did some stepping stones there. So number three, use low water plants. I told you I was going to tell you about the, the plant database and then we had the plant select books out there. Those are both really good resources. And I'll show you the plant database in a minute. But using low water plants isn't enough. You want to make sure that your plants are hydrozoned. So remember me talking about the different microclimates in your yard? You're going to want to do that. And on that plot plan, maybe put, this is facing the south. So I want some more natives or really tough plants there. That's where you're going to choose the plant palette for that area. And you're, going to, you're not going to want to put a coneflower or rutabecchia in with your tea roses because your tea roses are going to need a lot more water, need a lot more care. So you want to make sure that your tea roses are somewhere where it's easy for you to keep an eye on them and then your hardier plants in another bed. I'm not saying you can't have a tea rose, you can have anything you want, but you want to make sure they're hydrozone. So here is our plantsforgreely.com. We have about 350 plants on there, over a thousand photos. You can do searches, so you want to go in there. I want a perennial that's going to bloom in July, and I want it to be pink or red. You can put all that in there, and it'll pop up and give you some selections. Or I need a tall, skinny tree. Um, you could put the height. You could put uh, the 
the low water, you know, the how much water is low, moderate, or high, you can put all of that in there. And so this is what the actual landing page is, so that you know you get to the right spot. And then up in the menu, you'll be able to do the um, search, the custom search. But you can just scroll through it, too, and just look at things. So using soil amendments, you want to improve the soil. Our soils in this area are clay with a little, pocket, little pockets of sand. Either way, clay or sand, you're going to improve it with compost. It's going to add organic material. It's going to keep water in the root zone with the sand. It's going to help break up the clay for the clay people that have clay. Either way, sand or clay, it's going to help. Um, it'll help keep moisture. The organic matter encourages uh, micro and macro organisms to come in and keep that soil healthy year after year. And um, I can't really emphasize that enough. The only thing I would say is if you're going to do a lot of really um, native plantings, you might not want to amend as much because they're used to this, this soil here. So native plantings, you're not going to need it as much. But if you're bringing in things, especially things that are blooming, you're going to want to improve the soil. And then I just threw this up here. Um, it's just a basic soil pro profile. But just to show you, the blue in the pictures shows you see how the, in the sand it e automatically goes straight down. The loam, it kind of keeps it in the root ball area. And clay, we all complain about clay, but it actually is a good thing because it wicks sideways. So it keeps the water up higher for you so that's more available, especially when you're planting new plants. So the thing with clay is amend it so it breaks it up a little bit, but it's, it's a pretty good soil. Next is mulch. So using mulch will help you retain moisture as well. I think of putting mulch in your bed after you've done your whole garden, kind of like putting a coat of paint on the wall. It's pretty quick and easy and you get really good results pretty fast. So it's kind of like the finishing touch to your garden. So it helps retain water. It helps suppress weeds. Um, in the winter when we have wild fluctuations in temperature, now we're just having warm temperatures, but you, the soil's going from cold to hot to cold to hot. It helps regulate that a little bit so it's not stressing out the plants as much. Like I said, it gives it a finished look. People always ask also about fabric, whether they should put fabric down. Generally, the rule of thought now is don't do fabric. Your weed seeds just come in on top, and then you're pulling them. They're easy to pull off of the fabric, but it eventually breaks down, and then you're having to pull it out anyway. So if you're going for low maintenance, just leave the fabric out of it. I, just, I used to do the gray stuff, and I really would not even do it anymore. Um, now mulch, organic or not, so the or organic mulches would be your shredded cedar, shredded redwood, um, even your recycled wood mulch, any of those are good. You can use rock, but I wouldn't use rock too much. Uh, plants tend to need more water in rock, especially if they aren't complete, the rock isn't shaded. It gets pretty hot and it also creates heat islands for your house. So I would say use rock as accents and sparingly and don't go too crazy with it. Irrigate efficiently. The goal is to keep the water on the lawn or near the plant's root zone and not water the street like the top picture. So avoiding runoff, we talk about cycle and soak where you run it instead of say spray heads which is what's in that picture. Instead of running them for 15 minutes, do three cycles of five minutes each, or even three cycles of four minutes each. You've shaved off three minutes there, and you're going to get a better, um, a better process because that first one gets the top wet, the second one starts to soak in a little bit, that third cycle really soaks in and gets the lawn wet. We've had people that have had chronic runoff of their property on a slope, and they've tried the cycle and soak, and they've been able to eliminate it. And again, you want to keep the water not just for the conservation part of it, but it, going through that root system, it's going to clean it up again. So avoid overspraying too much. Um, you know, the sidewalk, spraying across the sidewalk. 
Don't water in the middle of the day. We try to tell people don't water if the sun's out. If the sun's out, don't water. It's just going to evaporate. Uh, put a wind sensor on your irrigation system so it doesn't come on in the wind either. Wind displaces a lot of water. And then you're just watering your neighbor's yard. Um, another question we get a lot is about pressure. They think with the irrig irrigation system, more pressure is better. And spray heads are designed to run at about 35 to 40 PSI, and rotors are designed to run at about 65 PSI. And I have a park sky over here. Would you agree with that? Yep. yep. So if you have both spray heads and rotors in your yard, you may have too high a pressure for the spray heads and too low a pressure for the the rotors. So be aware of that and the best thing you can do is call us and get in for an audit and Kevin can help you with that. But the best way to handle that too is pressure compensating heads so that if you do have to have both in your yard, it'll adjust that automatically for you. Um, we recommend that over putting a pressure reducer on the whole house. Slopes, I talked about the cycle and soak and then backflow preventers. A lot of people don't realize if you have an irrigation system, you should have a backflow preventer. And what that does is say one of those heads gets broken off or that fire hydrant needs to be used and we get low pressure in a zone, it'll keep from sucking bad water back in. Once it's out in the soil and on the grass, you don't want to be sucking it back into your house because that lawn may have pesticides on it. You don't want to be drinking that. So the backflow preventer does that for you. So I talked about the irrigation audit, and that is a great way to have, to learn a lot about your irrigation system. Even if you think you know a lot, I guarantee you, you will learn something. So Kevin can come out, he'll check your current schedule and record it. He'll check your soil type. He'll check the pressure at the backflow and at a head and see what the difference is. And then these little catch cans that are, you see out there, we run the system and it catches the water and then we measure it. And generally people will say, well, that spot's always brown over there. Well, let's put a catch can there, let's look at it. And then you compare them and we come up with, based on those little catch cans, a precipitation rate. The precipitation rate will tell us how to program your clock. So you get your bill in gallons, your clock is in minutes, and the precipitation rate is in inches. And you're like, how do I convert that? The easy answer is, let Kevin do it for you. <laughs> and he can tell you exactly how to program your clock, and then you, he'll even do it for you if you need him to. The best thing about the irrigation audit, audits is then you're also eligible for rebates. And we offer rebates on clocks and the pressure compensating heads and things like that. Okay, so sign up if you want to do that online, greeleygov.com slash audits. It'll go right to the little form to sign up. Drip irrigation we recommend in those planting beds if you're going to be doing trees, shrubs, perennials. Um, if you're doing ground covers, you might want to do something like the top right where it kind of puts a little spray out because you want those uh, ground covers to move and fill in. So I have a little slide on that. People always ask, well, how much do I need to put on for the first year or whatever on their perennials, their conifers? So this is just a real simple thing, um, about a half gallon an hour emitter on anything a gallon or less. Um, on five gallons, you want about a gallon emitter, gallon per hour. And then when you get into your larger trees and shrubs, you want to do two to three or three to five gallons. Okay, is that clear? Do you want me to leave that up if, so you can write it down, anybody? Okay. Just helps you gauge how much you should be putting on. And then the other thing with drip is remember to go out there the next year and move it out a little further. I see all the time in commercial landscapes where the emitter is right next to a trunk that's this big around. Well, it's not doing any good there. So last is maintenance. You see in that top picture, that lovely little ground cover up there? It's puncture vine. So make sure you keep the noxious weeds out of your yard because they just spread and get worse. Both the bindweed and the puncture vine, if you get them early, they're not as bad. 
you make sure you want to get that puncture vine before it ever goes to flower. Once it goes to flower and goes to seed, you're going to have that in your yard for 20 years. So get rid of it. Puncture vine? I pull it. Pull it before it gets the thorns on it too. What? Well, the bindweed does. The bindweed does too. Um, you know, the bindweed, I just don't want to spray stuff on it because it's so close to my other plants. If you have to use something, what I recommend is getting um, a liquid and then using those little sponge applicators and painting it on the leaves rather than spraying because the minute you spray it, both of those like the heat. And so if you spray it in the heat, it's going to drift and get on your other plants. Uh, Shiloh, our city forester, he puts on a cotton glove. He puts on like a latex glove and then a cotton glove, puts his hands in it and then goes up the stem. That's what he says to do. But I like the little applicator. The other thing I've done is taken like a can, like a big can, and cutting the top and bottom off and put that over the bindweed and then spray it in there so it doesn't move. And the question is, what do you do when the property next to you is overridden with weeds? Um, I would, and the what? Yeah, I would try to create some kind of a barrier. Um, they have had good luck with some biological controls like the bindweed. So there's a little mite you can get and you just, it's on, they grow it on bindweed and you just wrap it around the bindweed. It's a slow process, like a three or four year process. And I've figured out that you don't want to do it like in a yard where it's getting irrigated, but you could do it in those dry areas. Um, and we've had Tina Booten from Weld County come and talk about weed control before. Um, we could certainly have her come back, but she is a great resource for that. And she's, you know, you could call her anytime. Um, so deadheading, and that's a good way to get rid of those weeds too, is make sure you deadhead before they go to seed. But deadheading your perennials and things too, because they look, sometimes they can look unsightly. Now, if you want the seed to spread, go ahead and leave them or cut them off and kind of do this and let them fall down. Uh, mowing, everybody knows how to mow a lawn. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Sprinkler maintenance though is really important. People think once they put it in and set that clock, they can set it and forget it. But you need to run it maybe even once a month and just walk through the zones. And I'm serious, I'm gonna belabor this. Get the audit, have Kevin walk through with you and be there to talk to him and ask him questions. And then you'll have a feel for what you need to do when you do those sprinkler checks. Um, I've thrown in a couple tree watering slides on maintenance because um, we work pretty closely with our parks department and with uh, forestry. And so these are actually Shiloh, our city forester slides, and I stole them from him. Um, you want to create that little barrier between the lawn and the trunk because you don't want to be hitting your brand new trees with the weed whacker. So put mulch in there and then that's where you want to concentrate your watering the first couple years so that that root ball gets wet and then you like I said before with the emitters you want to start moving it out so that those roots have to reach for the water and just do that gradually so that your trees get acclimated. Um, Good way to do it is use drip or soaker hoses on that. And then I had a picture. I stole a lot of pictures from him. This is one he did in the, one of the parks. So you can see how he built up a little berm to hold the water. They staked it, and then you just fill up that well, and that's how you're going to water it that first year. It's just five, six, seven gallons in there at a time. The best way to do it is to get in the soil and see, does it need more water? He says that he sees more trees fail from being overwatered than underwatered. So keep that in mind. You don't need to overwater it. You just need to keep it slightly moist so that water is available to it. But you, this picture, you can clearly see it's pretty dry. Shrubs, they don't need a lot of extra water. Um, once you get them established, they're pretty good. So if you're looking for very xeric plants, this is very general, but silvery leaves, fuzzy leaves, 
and waxy leaves on trees or on shrubs and perennials. Those are going to be generally your more xeric plants because they don't transpire as much water off of them. They're more adapted to be in a hot and dry climate. Um, like I said before, use drip irrigation on these. If you're broadcasting with spray heads, you're going to waste way more water. And when you're watering at the base where these plants need it, you're not going to be watering weed seeds. A lot of times if you're broadcasting the water, you're going to be watering weed seeds and you're just making more work for yourself. Again, use the mulch to keep the weeds sound down and also to prevent those fluctuations. And then pruning out dead or diseased wood. That seems pretty basic, but we see it all the time where people just leave a branch hanging off of a tree. I had a neighbor that had a branch in those hailstorms, was hanging off of the tree, and I kept thinking, I'm going to go tell them they need to cut that off. Well, I didn't do it fast enough, and the next thing I know, the branch fell and ripped a big strip all the way down their bark. So those are the kinds of things you want to prevent. On a mature tree, that's going to be stressed from that. In perennials and flower, annual flower beds, you can, there are drought tolerant annuals. There's some really good drought tolerant annuals. Zinnias are really good. Petunias are really good. So it's not that you have to just limit yourself to perennials. This is our, the bottom picture is our annual bed at the garden. And we put stuff in there and it doesn't get that much water than anything else after it gets established. Um, in annual beds, I don't recommend mulch because then you just have to move it the next year to replant. So I just plant those in bare, bare soil. Vegetable gardens, um, I recommend using lots of compost in those, probably more than you would use in any other bed. Vegetables are pretty heavy feeders and that just enriches that soil, makes it easier to grow. The more you can dig down, the longer your carrots are going to be, that kind of thing. You can use all kinds of things that you could just till in, like grass clippings, if you don't put weed and feed. Do not put weed and feed and use your grass clippings because it'll kill your plants. But you could use straw, you could use shredded leaves in the fall. Those kinds of things are great, and then you just till them in. Uh, now, the other thing I get is it's so expensive. It's so much more expensive to do xeriscape over lawn. And yeah, it could be. If you did completely xeriscape and didn't have to put in an irrigation system, I'd say it's a wash or cheaper. But I'm going to tell you some of my, because I'm really cheap, some of my cheap tricks I do. Um, I put this up here just to show you kind of a ballpark if you're trying to figure out a budget how much things are going to cost. So compost is going to be anywhere from 16 to 22 cubic yards, 22 bucks a cubic yard. Mulch, I'm not going to stand here and read it to you, but um, that'll give you an idea. But when I get down here to perennials, they can be around $10 or more. And four inches, you can see are around five to seven. Shade trees, a good shade tree, it's going to cost you probably 250, 260 bucks. Um, so you want to protect that investment once you get it in. So here are my ways to save money. Use coupons. Get the Val Pack. Everybody gets the Val Pack. Go in there and clip those out and use them. You can also go online to Val Pack or any of your landscape yards and you can just print off their online coupons. There's other mailers out there and I can't think of all the ones, but I noticed there was a bigger envelope last year coming. Use those. Get on landscape um, places, social media, and watch for their deals there. So I like to buy smaller plants in the two inch or four inch size because I'll be patient and wait for them to grow. They're also easier to dig those holes. So it's a little bit lazy and a little bit cheap. So, you know, you don't have to put in a gallon perennial. They're a lot more expensive. I talked about this earlier, about phasing in your project and doing the expensive hardscape stuff first and getting that out of the way. And then you can speckle in your plants after that. 
Another great way to do it is find another gardening friend or take a walk around your neighborhood, see plants that you like, and then go back in the fall and say, could I snip some of those seeds? That's another great way to get plants. Or your iris look like they need to be divided. I'll trade you some daylilies for your iris or whatever. That's another good way and meet some gardening buddies. In the fall, almost all the nurseries have sales and that's a really good way to go too. Plant in the fall, it's a lot cooler out so the plants don't need as much water but the soil's still warm so they get established. Um, fall planting is an excellent time. Anytime that the ground isn't frozen, you could plant trees, shrubs, or perennials. As long as they're well, I guess I should preface that by saying, as long as they're used to being outside, you don't want to take it from a warm greenhouse and then put it out in 40 degree weather. Um, on the hardscape part, you can salvage things. Go to the habitat store. There's always bricks and pavers and things there. That's a good way to do the, the hardscape on the, on the cheap. Make your own compost. I told you about our compost bin sale. That's a, another good way, make your own compost and you don't have to pay for it. And then another thing you can do is when you do have to prune trees, chip them on site and use that for your mulch. Or see if a neighbor's doing it. I threw up a couple of these old coupon offers. They're all old, so um, Miller's Greenhouse doesn't even exist anymore. Okay, so garden in the box, I talked to you about that. That is another good way to start a Xeriscape garden and do it fairly easy and kind of learn as you go. So the, if you're a City Greeley Water customer, you get a $25 discount off the purchase price. Those will be going on sale in March. We don't have our little booklets, but the, they usually have at least two or three sun gardens and at least one or two shade gardens. And that's an, a great way to just start out small. You can also go to our website and um, we have the link. We pay to have another uh, a nonprofit administer the program. So you go to our website, if you click on the link, it'll send you to their website. You're still okay, you're not going to some weird <laughs> website that's gonna jip you. Um, but we pay them to do the administration and get the gardens together and do all that. Plant Select, I had that book out there. That's another good resource. There's a ton of landscape designs on their page that you can just print off and use um, to design your garden if you're kind of nervous about doing it yourself. It's an easy way to have it pre-planned for you and then you just go and buy the plants. Um, if, has anybody ever been to our Xeriscape garden? Quite a few, okay good. That's a good way to go and see what things are going to look like when they're mature. We have about 30 trees out there and tons of shrubs tons of perennials and, and I showed you the couple pictures of the annual beds. So there's a lot of different things out there and we try to keep stuff labeled. It's not all labeled. We lose some of them every year but um, it's a good place to go and get some ideas too and see mature sizes because most of the stuff has been in for at least five to ten years. So I got through that a lot faster than I thought I was so I can take questions. So the question is, he had a neighbor who had some trees downed and he asked for the mulch. And yeah, if we're talking about the emerald ash borer, it ended up here because people moved firewood. But if that tree is already in your neighborhood, then yeah, it'd be fine to just have it ground up. I did that with my neighbor because he was um, having some trees tripped, chipped along our line. And I said to the guy, we'll save you some money, just dump it in my backyard. And that's a good way. It's not the prettiest mulch all the time, but it's not bad, you know. You could always top dress it if it's not terribly nice looking with something else too. And her question is about mulch. I'm repeating these so that everybody in the room can hear. Um, what, what's the best kind to use? I really like the shredded red cedar or um, redwood. It's more expensive, but because it's shredded and it's kind of stringy, once you throw a little water on it, it kind of mats together and doesn't blow, and that actually inhibits the insects, but that you brought up an important part. When you do put mulch around things, like that picture of the tree, you don't want to put it right up to the bark, because the mulch will eventually break down, and it'll also break down that bark. So you want to leave a little ring of soil between the stems of your plants or your 
um, your trees and the mulch. You don't want it right packed up against it. And her question is about the shredded rubber. In my opinion, I try not to put anything that's not organic. It's, I mean, you, I don't want that in my soil long term. I don't know what was in that rubber, you know. Um, in our old building that's right over here, there was a little area that they put rubber mulch, and I swear there was more rubber mulch in the parking lot than there was in the bed it was supposed to be in. I, I wouldn't do it. I mean, it's up to you. That kind of a thing might be better like under a play set for kids, but I probably wouldn't use rubber mulch. You know, I, I try to be as organic as I possibly can. Well, you can have rain barrels. No, they just changed the law. You can have two rain barrels at your house. Yeah. That was the state. The state changed that law. So a single family residential can have two. And the guy that's, it's 55 gallons or a total of 110. Um, and we did that rain barrel sale last year and we're doing it again this year. So you could get two. Um, and the guy that I have coming to do the rain garden, he could, he's the expert on that. And he's done talks for us before on the rain barrel legislation. So I think that was in 14, Pam, do you remember what year? 14 or 15? 16. In, in August of 2016, they changed the law and you can have two rain barrels. You have to have an overflow. I would recommend um, coming and talking to the experts at our compost bin sale, which is compost slash rain barrel sale, May 4th talking to them and or coming to the rain garden presentation and talking to Tyler about it because he can answer that. But you do want to have an overflow to avoid that. Um, and, and the questions about the water quality in the rain barrel. I mean, if, if you're not growing, getting algae in it, it should be bad, not bad. You don't want to store it in there forever. You only want to have it in there for a few days. So it, your water quality shouldn't be getting that bad. I think you could maybe put a little bit not a lot, maybe like a f 10 drops of chlorine bleach if you're worried about algae, or you could do those little algae dunks or mosquito dunks in there too if you're worried about mosquito larvae. But that's another reason why you don't want to keep it in there forever because if you're moving water through it, you're not going to get mosquito larvae, things like that. And again, if you come to that one with Tyler, he can answer a lot of those questions. So I'm going to do my little commercial. We're going to do the rain barrel compost bin sale, so be looking for that information to come out. Um, I've told you about my plant database before. If you've been here before, if you're new to that, I'm going to have a whole slide on that later on. Uh, garden in the Box is a pre-planned Xeriscape garden that you can purchase, and it comes with one to three designs. That's uh, If you're really new to this and you want something really simple, that's a great way to start um, gardening. The garden tour is another great way to go and kind of be a voyeur in someone else's yard and see what they've done. So that'll be coming up in June. Of course, we still have rebates and audits. Um, if you're interested in an irrigation audit, I'm gonna do a slide on that, but Kevin is doing indoor audits right now. So if you've got a high bill or you just wanna have him come do an indoor audit, we can do that now, this time of year. And then the irrigation will start in April. And then these are the next few lectures coming up. So I'll leave that up a minute for you to look at. Um, they are all up and ready for you to register online. So you could do any of those, go home and do them tonight. Oh, and I, I mentioned that we're gonna be taping this. So if you have somebody that you know that um, didn't make it tonight and they wanna see it, you can always Go to the website and look at it. It'll be on YouTube. And then if you have Comcast, it'll be on Channel 8. Um, I found a really good seasonal one year, and she's actually here tonight. But I lost her at the end of the summer this year, and so I will be looking for a couple seasonals to work at the Xeriscape Garden. So that would be another way to get some hands-on experience. And... Um, pretty flexible. You could do full-time or part-time. It's a great gig for a teacher that has summers off. And then we're also going to be hosting some volunteer days and some hands-on opportunities um, coming up, like possibly building a rain garden out there.